As leaders, you want to hold the course as much as possible, but you also kind of want to read into the direction of where you're going and understand when you take risks and when you kind of pull back. And I would mm. say that's the biggest difference. And that's what's really important for leaders to be able to understand. In the you know, current economic environment, there are risks that you need to take, but you need to do them in a certain way. Maybe you need to be a little bit safer about it. But I think that's the biggest thing to understand. Like you still, day to day for the team, whatever the stock is, it shouldn't matter. This is Reveal, the revenue intelligent podcast. Here to help go to market leaders do one thing, stop guessing. If you're ready to unlock reality and reach your full potential, then this show is for you. I'm Danny Wasserman, coming to you from the Gong Studios. Ladies and gents of Reveal, Danny Wasserman, your host of the podcast. Rather than saying welcome, I believe it's in order to say howdy, because when you look at this next guest's LinkedIn profile, you may confuse him for someone on Yellowstone. That hit show, because he is rocking a cowboy hat, and I'm oozing with Chelsea, because I just look like a schmo wearing a cowboy hat. But enough about me. Let's talk about the man you paid to come here. We're talking about James Underhill, the Senior Director of Sales Operations and Strategy at MongoDB. MongoDB, you might be wondering, huh, where have I heard them before? It's because they have recently come into just being the darling of Silicon Valley. In his time at MongoDB, James has been there when the shares have been trading for $56. And now, yes, he is at a height where Mongo is trading in upwards of $560. So what is his secret? Well, when he thinks about operations, having started as a measly analyst and now rising to the perch at which he sits, he thinks about slowing down the pace of play. He thinks about opening up the aperture and rather than purely and simply looking at operations as a cost center, managing costs as one might ordinarily think, no, he's thinking bigger and he runs his team as if he was, you ready for this? A product manager. We'll hear more about this refreshingly novel and cool perspective on how ops could actually be run as opposed to how it should be run. Listen to this banger of an episode. DJ, spin that. James Underhill in the studio. Welcome, James. Thank you, Danny. Appreciate that uh, intro. You'd be shocked how many people have said that I look like the character from Yellowstone, actually. I know we talked I about mean, that, but like so many people. And I haven't seen it, so it's not intentional. It's just me. I take that as an incredibly high compliment because <laughs> A, that character is super cool. B, he is ruggedly handsome. So without causing any oh, discomfort, well, so <laughs> take, take that all the way back to the bank, man. <laughs> uh, I know how to take a compliment. Thank you very much. There you go, man. Well, James, we had a conversation before this episode. And one of the things I found really refreshing and novel about your approach to ops is you said something to the effect of there are a lot of your peers who look at what ops should be, and that being the operative term. Ops is a cost center. So ops technically should be looking at how do you save on costs, right? Sure. That's not rocket science. And you flip that idea on its head. I'd love for us to start. How do you approach ops? Because I think it's a more revolutionary idea. And go figure, if you look at MongoDB, you are on an absolute terror right now. And I have to think that part of your approach is lending itself to your broader core company success. For sure. You know, I, I, I've done a lot of thinking about this and I think I love just to kind of tell a little bit of my story at MongoDB because a lot of that evolution of, of, of Mongo and of myself have kind of led us to where we are and to some of those assumptions that I've made. But when I started at MongoDB, I mean, I was an analyst. It was just me and a couple of Salesforce admins. And we, or at least for myself, I was just doing what I was told purely. Like my understanding of sales, go to market, sales ops was build this comp model. The objective is this, build it help this leader with territory management, do this thing. And I was just doing all of the functions. It was spread very wide, but I was very thin in what I was doing and my understanding of the role. And I was very much of the perspective as well as like, I need to be as productive as I can because we don't want to invest too much in this function. We want to invest more in productive AEs. That's where our investment should be going. And, and for the most part, that's true. And as I developed in the role, I got a lot of, took a lot of inspiration from conversations that we had with with my boss, Megan Gill, and her boss, Cedric Pesher, CRO, where we'll be talking about things like territory management. And I might come in with a little clip of like, oh, we can like save. If we do this, this thing this way, I think it could be a little more efficient. And they'd be like, okay, yeah, but you understand like territories at least is 
what are the biggest levers we have on making reps more productive? What could we do if? What could we do if we could scale this out or make this better? And started asking questions about not just like, hey, how can we you know, make your job easier and more scalable? But how do we make it actually use it as a lever and think about it as a lever to make sales more effective? And what would we need to do those things? And we start posing questions in that way. Then you start to, then it caused me to start to think, well, what would, what would we do? And knowing that like subject matter expertise really well, it started to change the way that I thought more about like, okay, well, how can I be more efficient with my time to like, how can we provide a product that allows the sales team to be more effective? And I'm using territory management just as an example, because I've been really deep in that, that area of expertise within MongoDB. But I think it applies, it, do, it does apply to, to all of ops. And uh, just another anecdote is like, during the beginning of COVID, we were hiring a lot. And we're based in New York City, I'm in, I'm in the city. We hire a lot of ex-consultants for roles within sales ops. And so when you're hiring that, that profile, like they don't know deeply what sales ops is or all the, the nuances that you might be like reviewing with somebody who's a little bit more senior has experience in that field. And so I had to explain it to them in a way that was more, a little bit more abstracted, a little bit more relatable. And the way I would describe it was that we're product managers of sales. You're looking at sales like this is the objective of what we want them to achieve. How do we get them to achieve that? What are the requirements of these things? And how do we put together the user stories and how do we start to build solutions that all align to achieving that kind of output? And when you abstract yourself a little bit and you think of yourself as like a product manager of a series of products, you start to think bigger about what could it be? What's the potential there? And throughout our journey and, and now where I'm at now, my role is a little bit interesting in that I own like a portfolio of products that augment the sales team. It's really interesting to kind of straddle those two types of thinking, like the product level thinking and the ops level thinking. Because when you work with both, you see the juxtaposition in those, those people and it's intentional and it, it's a feature. Like a product person is going to be like, oh, there's a problem. Let's take 10 steps back. Let's understand like the nature of the problem. The way it's being characterized might not even be the real problem. And I want to understand everything about it. An ops person will say, oh, well, I think I've got three solutions and like we can go super fast. And you like when you hit to the scale that MongoDB has, and that's another big learning, like when we were small, when I started, problems could be solved by adding like another column in the spreadsheet, right? It was like the level of complexity was low. But, you know, I've, I have the feeling that as you scale in SaaS, the level of complexity of your organization is not linear. It's like exponential or quadratic. So as your sales team doubles, like the entropy or complexity, you're going up four times. So when you think about making, providing solutions or making changes, you need to be really, really sure about the real problem that you're solving and how you're solving it and making sure that it scales. So I've said a lot, but it, I think it, it's, it's an interesting perspective to how ops can run and thinking more about what could we do instead of what should we do. And I think everyone knows like what ops should do, but but what could do isn't always the question people ask. What I would say is for the last few minutes you've been speaking, I've been sitting on my hands and trying to bite my tongue because I have about 30 questions I want to ask you now. <laughs> please, please. And first and foremost, you're prescribing an entirely new way to approach the job. We interview lots of your peers who are at the helm of operations, revenue ops, sales ops, marketing ops. No one that I can remember has ever thought of this job should be you know, conceived from the lens of being a product manager. And if you're a product manager, the questions you ask look different than if you're a traditional ops leader. Can you give us an idea? People listening to these episodes say, oh, that's brilliant. I just don't even know the types of questions I should start asking. Let's look at this, James, as if you're prescribing this in a crawl, walk, run. Mm -hmm. Hey, I want to do something different with my ops organization today. What are the first questions I should be asking if I'm going to adopt your philosophy? Yeah, I think there's a couple things I would mention. One is that I'll say a keyword, detachment. Detachment is just the process of separating the forest from the trees. Mm -hmm. When you're in ops and you're intimately responsible for solving a problem, it becomes hard to see the, the bigger problem for what it really is and what it means. So like a really small micro example might be like, oh, you know, a sales leader might come to us and say, I want to, uh, I need a list of all the AI companies right now so I can position this new marketing thing to them. We, we can start outbounding to them or whatever. And, you know, an analyst might 
go and run a query on Salesforce, put together a list and send it to them. And now you have, you know, you, you've answered that question and you can go on to the next thing. But if you, if you take a step back and, and this is just a small example, but if you take a step back and understand what the real question is, it's like, the question is like, they have a profile that they want to be able to address. And they don't have a good way of doing that. And they've identified what that profile is. And so instead of being like, oh, well, I can solve this for you and then just move on, maybe like under, get an understanding if that is actually a good idea, maybe finding AI companies, try to find a process that solves that holistically. Like maybe there's a automated process you can put in that identifies that across the entire company and create leads or some system that allows reps to know when there's a good selling opportunity along, you know, a line of that ICP. And now everyone gets the benefit of that instead of a one-off thing that will never be achieved until you do another manual process. So the, the high level is you want to be able to detach yourself enough from the problem that you can see what it is. And you start asking questions like, well, what is the real problem? Like, why are they coming to me for this? It's because they know they have a sense of what they want, but they don't know how to get it and they need help. And like, there, there's more within that than, than just the, the request. But like there's, you know, you could extrapolate that up to like a bigger use case, like forecasting, mm -hmm. working with a forecasting tool and, you know, but well, the problem is we need to be able to roll up deals in this way. Okay. Well, like, is that going to be the problem next year? Is that a problem because of a change that we just made? Is that a problem because the scale we're at? Like, what's the real problem? And if we're going to continue to scale, I need to understand the nature of that problem really well so that we build robust and scale proof systems. So your question was, what, what are the questions that ops leaders need to ask in order to be able to start thinking from a product perspective? Yeah. And I would say that high level, it is really just zoning in on the nature of the problem and how our stakeholders are addressing that. And, and, and then trying to understand how ideally they should do that. And why ops is important in that equation is that we uniquely, we see the organization from a really unique viewpoint where like a sales leader often will just tell you, hey, this is how you should do something. Another sales leader should tell you, this is how you should do something. They don't often always agree. But we see the company from the perspective, a different perspective. Mm. And so you can, in the aggregate of all that kind of feedback, we can build solutions that address real problems. So understanding of the problem is super, super important. And I think ops is programmed to work really quickly. And so you need to create a sort of detachment from the problem so you can look at it for what it is, take a step back, really understand it before you start going into your solutioning phase. When you talk about ops has a tendency to work really fast and you talk about sales leaders saying, hey, this is how you do it. And there's a fairly instantaneous loop of a question and answer. You've posed a alternative to that pace, one that detaches or decelerates maybe the in instantaneous habits yeah. we've developed. And I think inherently that's in conflict with the pressures we feel from competition, the pressures we feel to deliver on results. If yeah. you're publicly traded, the pressures that you feel every three months when you have to report on earnings. So talk to us about when you are operating from the vantage of being a product manager and trying to maintain visibility into the forest as opposed to getting lost in the trees, you want to slow down, but can you reconcile that with some of the pressures you feel? Or culturally now, have you had enough wins that people are willing to trust your instincts and operate on a longer time horizon? Well, I think having political capital is important at an organization for sure. But I mean, I'll, I'll, you need to be able to, a leader needs to be able to, to understand the difference between work and value. And when you own a function, you need to be able to see it for like, there's a lot of things that we could do. But if you think about like the 80 20 rule, right? Like there's really only a handful of things that we absolutely need to do. And with the remaining bandwidth that we have as a leader, you want to focus on the things that are creating the most value. And I think like we talk about this internally in MongoDB a lot going through a, within leadership, going through a cycle of what do we, what do we need to stop doing? Like that complexity, you're right. There is a ton of pressure, especially within ops to continue to deliver and to move fast and do a lot of things. But one core component of the product is like saying no and understanding where, you know, we could do this and it like might help you for like a week or two or whatever. It's certainly going to add value. If somebody wants something, it's not because it's random, it's going to add value, but understanding what is going to add the most value. And that's what leadership, particularly like as an ops organization, me as a leader 
That's what my job is. Understanding where the most value is and making those trade-off decisions. That's how you get the space to be able to work. Because when a million small things come in, I know that there's the big rocks and I have to make sure they're taken care of. And I know that we need to do the appropriate level of scoping and you know thoughtful introspection about them. And that might mean saying no to some other things. And you know people might not like that, but at the end of the day, our job is to provide the most value to the organization. So you have to do that calculus. And you've identified that bookends of your experience at Mongo have included the simplicity of adding a column to a spreadsheet to now being a publicly traded behemoth with billions of dollars at play. And I'm curious, when you've experienced Mongo at $56 a share, and you've experienced Mongo at $560 a share, that changes the stakes of the game. And I'm wondering when you talk about still maintaining control over how you prioritize and triage what's asked of you, where does that degree of influence from the outside begin to muddle the waters or distort the simplicity and the crystal clear outlook that you intend to try and preserve? Maybe I'm being long-winded here. The point being, when you start having all this wind at your back and momentum, does that totally impact and change how you run your business or is it still stay the course? I think that effect can, you know, applies to not just ops, but applies to sales, R and D, mm -hmm. to to really any function. And as leaders, you wanna you wanna hold the course as much as possible, but you also kind of want to read into the direction of where you're going and understand when you take risks and when you when you kind of pull back. And I would mm -hmm. say that's the biggest difference, and that's what's really important for leaders to be able to understand in the you know current economic environment. There are risks that you need to take, but you need to do them in a certain way. Maybe you need to be a little bit safer about it. But I think that's the biggest thing to understand. Like you still day to day for the team, whatever the stock is, it shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we emphasize that a lot. You know, our CEO, Dave, will, will, will say like the stock's going to go up and down. We keep, we keep marching forward. And that's true. But as leaders, you do want to read like the writing on the wall. Okay. Like when do we need to, you know, set expectations better about yeah. how, what expansion looks like, what growth looks like or, or whatever. And when we need to be more risky. What is an example of a risk you would have taken at 560 versus something that maybe you'd be more calculated now that you've dipped a bit? I mean, I think like something common for, for organizations is when the markets are frothy, you want to invest. More data, great. More tools, great. Like you want to really think like in terms of upside, you know, the more data that we have on sales, great. To be able to identify better targets, prioritize mm -hmm. accounts for reps more tools that allow them to do more effective PG, you want to go headfirst into that. Whereas, you know, when there's a, there's a pullback, it's, it's more thinking about the value. Like you could have a million tools, but maybe you don't need them. Maybe if the, you know, if the ROI isn't significant, you're, you're starting to do a little bit of a different calculus. I, I think that's really the biggest risk. And it also, you know, it comes down to like, how do you build your team to structure your teams too? Now you might want to think about it. Like you might want to think about it differently, but I still think there always is, and kind of like the theme of what I'm trying to address is here, like there are risks that should be taken. There's always like risks that are worth taking. It just, the, the climate can influence that, but, but it's important to really, even regardless of where the economic client is or the economic uh, climate is, to have a pulse on the business to understand what those risks are. Just like James said, a solid ops leader understands where and what needs to be done to identify and change those business pains that slow us down. Well, in order to identify pains as a leader, you need to go where? The data. McKinsey found that 53% of companies who use data, not intuition, but use data to identify and fix business pains are considered, quote, fast growers. Additionally, 37% are still considered growers. And what did you wanna be in those two cohorts? From all this, we can clearly conclude that identifying the right data, which unlocks and isolates the pain, is what's going to beget success as either a fast grower or a grower. Back to James to hear a little bit more about how he does just that. I wanna double click into this idea of, even in the economic pullback, to use your words that we're in right now, there are risks that should be taken and that can be taken. And more so than ever, I believe your role in ops and your peers as leaders within revenue ops, sales ops, marketing ops, have a very influential voice in the buying committee. 
and thinking about when all these solutions are technologically forward and you need to certify, are these potentially new additions to our tech stack going to play nicely? You could tank a deal. You could totally, absolutely gut it, sabotage it, or you could push it over the end zone. And where I'm going with this next question, when you think about how you make the calculus to determine confidently, this is a risk worth taking and bringing something new. What can salespeople do when pitching fellow ops leaders to make that more apparent? Because right now, I think that historically we've tried to, as sellers, skirt ops and just go straight through the CRO because it's a peer-to-peer -peer sale. I'm a seller, you're a sales leader, we get one another. And ops is just kind of there as a gatekeeper, or a roadblock or an inconvenience. And now it's unavoidable. So we need to meet you where you're at. Talk to us a little bit about when maybe you've been pitched by someone who made that calculus, this is a risk you need to take and you can safely take. And maybe let's contrast that with attempts to garner your attention that always fall flat for one reason or another. I honestly don't think that uh, the way that you sell, whether it's in a strong economic client or, or a pullback, I, I don't think it should be that different. You should always, even when you're talking to ops, you should always be aligning it to positive business outcomes and negative consequences. And you should make it really clear about what they stand to gain or what they could lose by not doing something. In order to do that, you need to assess what the business pains are. And, you know, that's ubiquitous. Like anytime mm -hmm. you're selling, you need to be establishing those things. I think what is more helpful now that, or just recently in working with various vendors, and, and this is something that, this was part of the MongoDB transition, you know, while I've been here, is we moved mm -hmm. to a consumption model and we have free tier. And when we work with vendors that allow us to test things out and really assess what the value is, making a bet at that point is much safer than just going all in on a big ACV contract, right? Like that to me as a leader is the number one thing I want to look for. Can we, can we test this thing out? Can we kick the wheels? Can we get a couple of reps in? And if it is really valuable and it can really manifest, the, if, if they can show that there is value, I'm not taking so much of a bet. So if, if vendors can do that, that's really helpful. On the topic of showing value, there's a, you know, debate that wages on ROI. And obviously when you pilot something or you test it out, you can see when you get your hands really dirty and okay, like how intuitive is this? Even in a two to four week trial, great. What are the telltales or what are the tea leaves telling us about the value that if we go whole hog, we could experience, but even preliminarily, do you buy ROI numbers? Do you buy ROI numbers that don't come from your team? What's your appetite for those complementary numbers to justify the purchase and investment? I mean, a lot of, a lot of times the ROI, like the numbers that calculus is a lagging indicator. Okay. So I think that would be, that would be kind of my advice to sellers looking to, to break into organizations right now is identify what the leading indicators are and make sure those things are, you're agreed with, with the team that you're implementing them, whether it's the ops team or the sales team or whoever, these are the leading indicators to value and start to measure if you guys think you can hit them. Within sales, I'll just give like a quick anecdote. We implemented this system called Metrics for Success. Okay. Metrics for Success comes from a book called The Four Disciplines of Execution. The four disciplines are one, establish a wildly important goal. Two, determine a leading indicator to that goal. Three is put together a dashboard that measures the leading indicator. And four is set up a reinforcement cadence to accomplish that thing. And we use that system to be able to understand if reps are on a more frequent basis to understand like if they're going in the right direction or not, if they need coaching or if they need yeah. help or where we need to, you know, managers need to intervene. And the idea is, you know, if you're just looking at the sales that they're making, that's super lagging. So we need to have a metric that's much sooner to understand. And like, that's the core of a lot of our sales management is, is monitoring that system. And I think I'm bringing this back to, you know, the process of establishing ROI, like, Within sales, there's so many laggy indicators, like just so many discussions about like SDR productivity, for example, or even sales productivity. You see those things over time, but mm -hmm. when you want to make a decision about changes, you have to focus on leading indicators and you have to be confident in how you assess that. But th that would be my recommendation to sellers is work with the, you know, the buying teams to establish like what, what are the leading indicators and what they want to see and see if you're able to hit them. For someone like you, who seems to have such a clear vision of the leading indicators that determine the success and fate of MongoDB, what are, I don't know, a random smattering of the leading indicators that you're regularly <laughs> monitoring? Yeah, well, my product mind is saying we got to take a step back 
that you're going into solutioning? <laughs> what are the leading indicators? You got to take a step back. What are the goals? Okay. So goals to us would be like reduce churn. We've got $1.5 billion of ARR. We want to keep it. So if we're going to reduce churn, then leading indicators might be like, well, something like what's our coverage of our customer success team across accounts? Mm -hmm. How effective are they being able to manage those accounts? And then you can go, you can drill down into those into, until you get to metrics. Like how much mm -hmm. time are they able to spend with the account that they're on? How many accounts are they assigned to and how much, how many of them are actually talking to? How much time are they taking to prepare for calls? And then on the other side of that, you know, for the, for the accounts that they're working, do we actually see growth above what we'd expect to be organic? That I think starts to be more of a lagging indicator. But you got to start with, you know, depending on what you're selling, you got to start with what's the objective that it's trying to solve in, in, within, those are typically three, cut, churn prevention, expansion, and customer acquisition. So if you can tie yourself to one of those things or, or several of those things, and then boil that down to leading indicators, that's what you want to do. Really helpful. Well, I mean, even just putting me on blast and saying, Danny, <laughs> you're going for the lagging indicators, man. We got to think yeah, bigger. Yeah. You got to slow down. I really appreciate that. Well, James, just really riveting stuff to hear how you slow down to speed up and thinking about your world, not simply as a cost center that controls costs or turns out comp plans and territory plans, but that you operate as a product manager. My second to last question is, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, are you bringing on developers and engineers internally within your team to really embrace that sort of product manager mindset and doing your own development internally so that you can satisfy what the needs of the business are being sort of, I don't know, delivered to you. Talk, is, is, is that an yeah. accurate representation of what you're doing? And if so, talk to us a little bit about how you've actually started developing your own stuff internally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have done that. Now, I don't think every organization needs to bring on a development team just to kind of think bigger, think more expansively. Mm -hmm. In our journey, and particularly when I was really focused on like the territory management side of ops, we realized that what we were doing was creating like a repetitive process mm -hmm. that needs to be executed at a global scale. And there was a data management component and a, a strategy of just getting data to the right people to make decisions in the right way. And software is a really good way to do that. We are a software company. And so we wanted to eat our own dog food. And so a couple of years ago, we invested in a team of engineers to build a territory management tool called Argos. And what Argos does is allows leaders to view their, their reps territories, to propose changes to those territories, to be able to kind of like, sometimes I describe it to Americans as like fantasy football for kind of like accounts. It's like you kind of do yeah. scenarios, you can see like the stats and the scores, you can see what would it like if I move, you know, an account from Joe to Sally, how does that affect their books? Mm -hmm. Ultimately now, like those changes like interface with our compensation system because our book sizes affect quotas. And so it's become like a much more complex system, but it allows us to scale that function really, really well and gives people access to the most up-to-date and best data. And then in parallel, we've been working on a workload health tool, the MongoDB. We develop database software. Our tool Atlas is in the cloud. And a lot of times when developers are building on MongoDB for the first time, they might not, they might not be familiar with best practices of the NoSQL architecture. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is make sure that in that one onboarding process, that they're not setting up their database in a way that's going to prevent them from scaling. And so we more or less have a diagnostic tool that allows us to identify like what phase of their journey they're in. Are they in onboarding? Are they fully in production? Yeah. And then, you know, depending on the phase that they're in and the telemetry data that we're getting from the tool or from the database, like what, what's going to be a problem for them in the future or what's a problem now? And it allows our reps to be in our customer success managers also to be proactive in the discussions that they're having. And that builds a lot of credibility as well. Because when you reach out and you say, hey, notice you just signed up for our thing, let's talk. All right, cool. But when you reach out and say, hey, I noticed you signed up for this thing, but you're increasing your memory on this really random like cadence. Is that because you're having a you know, performance issue? Have you thought about adding indices? The developer's like, oh, actually, like the person might be able to help me. Let me take a conversation. So to get back to, to, get back to your original point, yeah, we have invested in building tools that complement like our core uh -huh. sales tech stack. And that has really allowed us to accelerate productivity at scale. Wow. Well, after this episode, no one will dispute that, James, you are, I mean, textbook pushing the boundaries of what ops can do, both theoretically and in actuality as product managers. 
if you've listened to the podcast, James, you know that we ask all of our guests the same last question. So hopefully this comes come as a curveball. But you know, if I'm going to throw you one absolute hook, line, and sinker, it's this: if you could describe sales in one word, what would it be? Perseverance. Oh man, he wastes no time. <laughs> Say more. I mean, there's a lot that you can say about sales, right? But what sales really like, and, and I think problem solving and so like, yeah, problem solving would be another way that I would, I would characterize it. But I think it really is like when you, when you meet amazing sellers, you understand that so much of it is understanding that you have a solution, getting to the right person. The whole, the whole process of it is perseverance. Mm -hmm. Like you can be a really good seller. If you're not perseverant, it doesn't matter. The profiles that we look to, we actually do assessments hmm. of anyone that interviews for a sales role MongoDB. We do a, more or less like a personality assessment. And then what my team does is like we run a model that compares the assessment results to historical productivity of reps. And what we see is the people who are perseverant, who are not deterred by obstacles, do the best in sales. It's, have the, have yeah. the competencies and the qualities of successful people evolved over time? So what six years ago made up a successful MongoDB seller? Is it one and the same in today's day or does it look totally different? I'm going to say short answer, it's, it's more or less the same. Long answer, we change a sales role. Now we have like an acquisition channel, a growth channel, you know, customer success team. And within those, there, there are different competencies that matter. But I think like one, one common, I think, misconception a lot of people think is like, Hey, in order to sell MongoDB, you have to be super technical. You've got to be able to talk to engineers. And yeah, you do have to understand the product for sure. But what sales is, is not solving technical problems. It's finding business pains where technical problems are the solution. And when we have really technical reps, sometimes they just nerd out with the customer too much and they don't actually get to the crux of the problem that they have and they're not able to escalate in the organization. So good reps really like they're extremely perseverant. And they're good at getting to the heart of like those business pains and asking the mm -hmm. right questions when it's, it can be uncomfortable. And one of the leaders that we have is awesome, Jesse Green in New York. When I was at sales boot camp, the way he characterized like some of this qualification, he was like, if you've got an easy button sitting at your desk and you can hit that button and it'll tell you the answer like, yeah, th this person is interested in this deal or not. Why wouldn't you hit that button? If you're going to hesitate to hit that button, then you need to think about leaning in and qualifying properly, right? Like, I think it can be tough to ask the questions that you need to ask. And uh, those are the qualities that make it successful reps and that haven't changed. Amazing. Well, you heard it. Perseverance. James Underhill, Senior Director of Sales Operations and Strategy at MongoDB. You have absolutely given us an embarrassment of riches with your knowledge and your tricks of the trade. So we can't thank you enough. I speak on behalf of our entire audience and listenership when I offer our gratitude to you for being so keen along the way. James, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Danny. It's been fun. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Reveal. If you want more resources on how revenue intelligence can help you create high-performing sales teams, head on over to gong.io. And if you like what you heard, come on, give us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you may listen. 